Hello and welcome everybody to our expert panel on requests for proposal management for the industrial internet. My name is Dirk Slama from Bosch and also Ferdinand Steinbeis Institute. I'm the moderator of this panel and I have three expert guests here today with me. We have Vijay Ujain from PwC, we have Tim Morish from Transformer Insights and Barsam Zarkut from IGN Power. And yeah, I look very much forward to discussing what to do and not to do managing RFPs for the industrial internet. We will structure this discussion along the different modules of IC's RFP toolkit, which has five elements. First, we have challenges, risks, and mitigation in RFP management for IoT solutions. Then we have project planning, which typically is a mixed bag between general project planning and specifically the planning of the RFP projects. Then we have the actual RFP document, so how to create the RFP document. Then we have um, IC's online wizard for RFP creation that we want to briefly discuss. And finally, we will talk about the process of distributing the RFP and vendor selection. Okay, so let's start our expert panel by talking about challenges, risks, and mitigation from the point of view of an IoT project. So in terms of challenges, we discussed this before, they're basically the combined challenges of an enterprise software project, of a telecommunications project, of an AI project, and an embedded hardware and software project. So these type of challenges leads to very real risks. Basam, can you talk about the risks? Uh, yes, thanks, Dirk. Uh, well, the, the risks fall in two categories. Uh, risks related to the vision and the solution definition, and then risks related to the implementation. Uh, let me talk about the risks about the solution vision. Um, selecting the wrong vendor, for example, uh, may may uh, lead to a disaster from, from a project point of view. Selecting the wrong technology, if you uh, uh, bet on a specific solution strategy where you are embedding certain types of technology and these end up uh, being the wrong technology choices, that will uh, represent a significant risk um, for the project. Uh, the other risk related to the solution vision is uh, if you focus uh, too much on bleeding edge technology or if you focus on uh, technology that is uh, reaching the end of its life. So all of these uh, important issues play a significant role in the, uh, in the risk uh, for the project and uh, the, the, the team um, responsible for the design of the project and the division of the project should take all of these uh, parameters into, into consideration. But this is on, on the solution vision side. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe somebody else can talk about the actual implementation risks. BJ, maybe you? Uh, yes, thanks, Dirk. Uh, so as uh, as Basam mentioned, there are like different categories of risks, and uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, risks on the implementation side. On the implementation side, right? Like where you could have a improperly chosen vendor or an improperly chosen solution uh, that could pose uh, issues with functionality or uh, stability of the system during the implementation uh, or quality issues. There are also uh, risks associated with uh, improperly planning for schedule. There, is, there could be a schedule overrun costing time or a uh, budget overrun uh, with, uh, with assumptions that were made without uh, much of a homework between what would it take to, uh, to go through this process might result in overruns on the, on the budget side. And then uh, if, uh, if there is a lack of user buy-in, if there was no uh, not enough input from the end users, and they have uh, no buy-in into this uh, into this process. That might 
uh, result in a non-successful implementation results in uh, and there's a risk of a non-successful implementation because after the implementation is complete the buyer the users might not even be uh, motivated to use it uh, similarly, things with uh, with non-compliance and also uh, and the worst kind of risk right, is the one with the business disruption where implementing a solution would actually disrupt the the main business uh, the, the main business itself. Um, let's move on to the question. Jim, um, we had a lot of discussions how important it is to really understand the strategic positioning of your IT solution, also from a procurement point of view. Can you talk a little bit about um, what this means? What kind of strategic uh, options are there? Absolutely, yes, I can. Um, so I'm not gonna go through the content of the slide, that, that's already been presented, but but yeah, the, the overall discussion I think that we, we had at the time of developing this was around the fact that you could have some very critical applications or very critical solutions uh, which were core to a company's core business, um, but 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 with which they couldn't really differentiate, um, and so they could potentially partner or get a productized solution. Um, and and probably the most extreme example of that is, um, is is a smart metering solution, say an electricity smart metering solution. That those things basically exist ready off the shelf, customizable. If you're a utility, you can deploy them, um, and they obviously enable you to do smart metering, which is core key to your business. But it's not really a competitive differentiator versus other. Um, other, other utilities. So it's quite important to, 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 to highlight that, um, you know, to, to really invest in a strategic IoT solution, not only does it need to be core to your business, but you need to be able to do something different with it. There needs to be a point to making that investment. Yeah, other, other categories that, uh, other applications that sit in that category of, of, um, of, of being key to a business, but not really a competitive differentiator, potentially things like warehouse solutions for some, some market participants or fleet solutions. You know, if you're not, if you're not a fleet operator, but you're a big company with a fleet, then really you're not going to differentiate with your fleet solution. Um, so, so that's the thinking behind this chart and the, and the two dimensions that he shows there. So what's the, I mean, I understand that it's important to, to, to go through this analysis, but what's the impact of the results of this analysis on the procurement process? Well, the, 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 the impact is that, 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 that if you look at the slide and, and you, you conclude that there's a enabling solution or you have an enabling IoT solution, um, then potentially you'd be happy to, to externally source um, a, lot, a lot of that application or many components of that application or even the whole thing off the shelf. Whereas if it's a strategic IoT solution, that's something where you want to have a lot of control over what it does. Um, it's key to your business, um, and, and critically, you could use it as a competitive differentiator, and therefore, you specifically don't want something that's available off the shelf that, that all of your competitors have, because it's important to you, and you want to differentiate it with it. And, and that's why I think we came up with this, with this spectrum of enabling IoT solutions, allowing you to, to, to do things that are uh, more efficient behind the scenes, strategic things that really enable you to do different things, different value propositions or transformational changes in efficiency. And, and then in between, there's kind of auxiliary uh, IoT solutions where you don't need quite so much control um, and, and you prepare, be prepared to, um, to, to you know, procure some external components, you know, just, just to make the deployment quicker and more efficient and cheaper. Right. So it's very much about make versus buy, I guess. Exactly. Thank you. Um, specifically talking about the um, RFP process and the do's and don'ts um, in general, but especially in the context of IIT. Um, Basam, could you comment a little bit about uh, this? Yes. Uh, uh, one important aspect of IoT enabled solutions is that you are. Uh, experiencing the convergence of IT topics and IT discussions with OT operational technology uh, topics and discussions. And that convergence touches also on the procurement process. So uh, if you're not identifying all the stakeholders ahead of time and you're making sure that they can work together towards uh, defining the requirements in a clear way, 
and articulating a clear vision for the solution, uh, you will have an overall uh, poor uh, procurement process and a poor vendor selection process. So it's very important to identify the stakeholders that will be involved in the project and make sure that they can work together because it's a possibility that these stakeholders are working together for the first time. Uh, so from an IIT project's point of view, what are key stakeholders? Uh, definitely IT, definitely the operational technology, definitely uh, the security team, um, and of course, depending on the nature of of uh, the project, uh, you may have uh, other teams, uh, safety, for example, uh, reliability, and so on. So these individuals or, or teams within the organizations um, have been performing as silos uh, before, and now they need to collaborate together to define a clear vision and a, a clear involvement in the vendor selection process. Okay. So, um, to everybody in the panel, what, what's your experience with the procurement experts in large organizations? Do they have experience in managing IoT projects from the procurement side of things? Basam, Vijay, Jim. I can. I can. I can go first, uh, Dirk. Uh, the the experience, given the technology, and uh, because IoT or industrial IoT could mean so many things, uh, it's it's an amalgamation of things that could range from sensors to connectivity to uh, uh, to interactions with either on-prem or cloud uh, cloud environment, uh, as opposed to things that are contained, like other processes, either for uh, for the enterprise software or for other IT systems. Uh, it's in, the area is so broad and the area is so new. I think there is uh, th there is some ways to go uh, for uh, for procurement departments to be up to speed in many uh, many large organizations and uh, and in their defense, uh, you, you cannot have you cannot be an expert uh, on on the appropriate modulation and the limits are the advantages and disadvantages of that modulation for a connectivity mechanism and at the same time. Uh, know the intricate details of the tolerances of components of some sensors in an industrial uh, environment because of the area is uh, is so broad. However, I do see them uh, coming together in terms of like uh, every iteration, the process is improving, and uh, hopefully with uh, with this toolkit that we have, uh, it could it could help them accelerate even further to have a good clear RFP documentation. <laughs> Uh, just one one very quick comment uh, about the slide also, uh, Dirk, is that in some large projects, um, the uh, vendors involved may not be able to provide a complete solution. So uh, the, the, the uh, client may open the door for teaming, uh, teaming arrangements between multiple vendors and the RFP uh, process should cater for that and manage, be able to manage that as well. Okay. Next, let's talk about the details of uh, project planning. Um, again, Basam, I know that you feel very strongly about this. Um, we have a generic RFP process you know, where you plan your RFP projects, you create the RFP, you distribute the RFP, you, you go through the vendor selection. So, some can you talk us maybe a little bit through um, the IIoT specifics here and your experience with it? Well, well, I mean, uh, in in industrial projects um, are are different in nature from IT projects, traditional IT projects, in the sense that. Um, there is a, a significant engineering design aspect to the project initially, and that needs to be uh, well defined before you get to the stage of uh, identifying potential bidders and potential vendors. So it's not about simply defining requirements, but that there may be a, a design 
uh, aspect of the solution that need, the client needs to invest in. And that can be an entirely different process that right. requires its own RFP. So uh, that, that's an important consideration. The, the remaining part of the uh, RFP process is uh, straightforward to the extent of uh, the, the steps identified here are, are the common ones. You may have an RFI, a request for information step before you issue the RFP just to us so that you can identify uh, vendors who are likely to to be invited to the main RFP process. So uh, that, that's maybe an extra step. But okay. the, the engineering design aspect in the project planning is important. DJ, I'm assuming at PwC, you're involved in a lot of um, RFP process, either as a bidder or as a consultant to your customers. What are you seeing? Um, how professional are customers in the area of IoT and in, in following this this process? Are they well organized, or is it more an ad hoc process that that they're following? Uh, the customers are uh, are reasonably well organized uh, throughout the process. They they have the appropriate experts in place, uh, either when it comes to technology or through the uh, the process of, uh, of uh, procurement and having the right business uh, business sponsorship. Thanks, CJ. Okay, so let's move on to the actual RFP creation. So at the core of the RFP, we have our requirements, and quite naturally, and in the context of what we already discussed, there are quite uh, different types of, of, of requirements. So um, I mean, uh, from an IIT point of view, for example, functional requirements need to deal with the functionality of the system. Jim, you already gave some examples from smart metering to track and trace earlier on. Uh, what type of functional requirements do you typically see? Um, well, from, from a business perspective, it's much more about um, volumes, um, geographies are a critical thing. You know, is the solution going to be deployed in one country or in multiple countries? Um, the uh, you know, mobility of devices is a critical thing. The location of devices, I mean, it's something that's located you know, in indoors in a, effectively an office environment versus something which is uh, mobile, um, mobile in a rough environment. These are completely fundamentally different things to think about. Um, and you have to think of some really quite different different um, salutes, approaches to just connecting them. One of them requires you know, mobile communications. And if you're doing that in multiple countries and multiple geographies, you, you suddenly get into all sorts of issues um, uh, you know, around you know, interfacing to different mobile networks. Um, and of course, you're gonna get data protection issues and data sovereignty issues. So, so you know, there are some really critical business requirements that, that can really push the technical requirements and the demands placed on the project you know, really, in really quite extreme ways, you know, ju just in terms of you know, dimensioning that under, underlying business problem. Right, right. So I guess one challenge is to extract these uh, different perspectives from, from the different stakeholders um, and come up with one view. So how do you prioritize this? Um, well, it, 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 it's a little like peeling an onion. You have to go one level at a time. Um, you know, un understand what the, you know, what, what the overall business uh, aim is, um, which will quite quickly you know, take you, you will quite quickly answer a number of the key questions. Um, but frankly, um, I'm going to have to you know, circle back and say, to a great extent, this is why the tool exists on, on the resource hub, because um, what that is, is a, you know, is, is a list of many of these, many of the most critical areas with, with, with a calibration uh, rating what is a relatively easy IoT project versus what's a particularly difficult IoT project. So, so frankly, um, you know, as, as, as an end user, you've got the benefit of some people having done some of that thinking already. Um, but, uh, but, but really it is, you know, in terms of answering those questions and addressing those key points, you just have to move step by step by step. Um, and, 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 and having that list of questions is good to prioritize and help identify the areas I think that need to be probed and understood. Right. Thanks, Jim. Um, BJ, when, when uh, we looked at the um, structure of a typical RFP document 
um, for an IT project. I know that um, you felt very strongly about certain areas. Um, would you care to comment? Yes, uh, thanks, Dirk. So in, in areas where we have uh, this RFP document, one of the things uh, you know we all say, but not a lot of us actually practice, is documenting. Uh, documenting the functional uh, requirements. Uh, that's something uh, in any uh, organization that has a really good discipline in, in documenting their requirements, be they the functional, the non-functional, and having a very clearly defined scope uh, would have a much higher chances of, uh, of success than, uh, than otherwise. Okay, thank you. So as Jim mentioned, um, one of the key um, elements that we are offering from an ISC's point of view is the online wizard. Um, we have a video that shows how to use it, but maybe, um, Basam, I know that you've used it extensively. Can you talk a little bit about um, where you see the biggest value for the user, for example, the uh, RFP process owner? Of course, um, the the so the this RFP uh, toolkit uh, that's part of the uh, resource hub uh, allows um, the team uh, that is involved in scoping the project and and defining the requirements to uh, identify uh, the vast majority of the areas that impact uh, the project, the function requirements, non-function requirements, quality requirements. So it's a very structured process that forces the team to go through very, very specific uh, aspects of the project and uh, qualify them and quantify them so that uh, the end result uh, that is produced by that uh, resource hub tool will reflect the requirements of, of the project. Um, this is very important because of the large number of stakeholders that may be involved in this, in this project. And those stakeholders have different expectations and they have different cultures and they, they have different best practices. So this resource hub tool is, is a very important environment where they can call all of them channel their focus into uh, into the requirements of the project and embed and weave within these requirements the the needs that they have from uh, as stakeholders for functional non functional and quality requirements and and that output can then be uh, utilized later to actually produce the final RFP product but it advances the uh, uh, the work quite quite a bit. Thanks, Basam. So once you have um, used um, tool to um, create your RFP, the last step comes in is finalization of the document and then uh, distributing it and then actually engaging with the vendors and um, running the selection process. So. Um, where, from an IIT point of view, do you see potential uh, pitfalls here? Well, starting from the output of the uh, of the RFP uh, toolkit, uh, uh, the team responsible for creating the RFP can now uh, use that output and and create the RFP from it and apply the standards that apply within the organization such as DOD DIDs or some other some other standards uh, to standardize uh, packaged information within the RFP and make the RFP embed close controls over the evaluation process how you are going to evaluate vendors how you are going to score them how you are going to select them what is mandatory what is desirable and so on and so forth. So th this is a very important step that gets you closer to the eventual goal, which is a specific RSP, RFP that vendors can be responsive to. Thank you. So um, with this, we are already at the end of our uh, panel. Um, maybe just a question to everybody. Um, short closing statements. 
um, key takeaways. Um, Jim, Bassam, BJ. I think the key the key takeaways to this is that it's a complicated space. Um, one of the discussions that you, that you and I had, Dirk, many years ago, um, was that it's easy to find somebody with ten years of experience of hardware procurement uh, or development. It's easy to find somebody with ten years of experience of telecoms, and it's easy to find somebody with ten years of experience of IT. But finding somebody with ten years of experience of all of those things or each of those things is really quite difficult. Um, and and there are some really quite big you know potential pitfalls in these different spaces. It's quite easy to see you know an I, an IT guy uh, thinking from a systems perspective, um, and then saying right, I'll just do that globally, and 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 just not being aware of some of the issues with connecting to to, to different mobile operators and working on different band frequency bands in different countries and data sovereignty and and all of these things. So so it, I, I think I think the underlying message is is one of 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 that's quite complicated, but but not so complicated that it should be off-putting. Um, and I think this is where it's particularly helpful that you know experts in the ISC have been through and put together you know a procurement uh, and, and an RFP engine uh, in, in in Resource Hub, and, and also there are other tools there to help you know understand all of the bases that need to be covered. I think as an end user, if you've covered that list of things, then you've addressed most of the big issues and you're not going to suddenly in, in, in the next week discover something that's it's, it's really problematical and, and, and going to throw your process. It, it kind of gives a good um, landscape, uh, it defines the landscape that needs to be addressed and covered. Tom? Well, I, I agree with everything that Jim said, of course. Um, I, I would add to that uh, that the RFP should be written in a way to express the initial vision uh, of the project, and, and that vision should be a, a reasonable and, and practical vision. And the uh, evaluation and the response should be structured in a manner that allows you as a client to uh, assess how close is each bidder getting you to the vision that you've specified rather than being lost in the details of item a and item b and item c uh, the, the 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 process should allow the vendor the, the client to um, uh, always keep an eye on the overall vision of the project and whether that particular bidder is how close is that bidder getting uh, the client to that vision? So that, that's, I think, an important aspect of the of the, of the solution. And obviously, the complexities that uh, Jim mentioned don't make that task easy. Right. Okay. Thank you, Basam. VJ. Yes, I echo the same thought from uh, from Jim and uh, and Basam. This is a a complicated process, uh, right? No, no mistakes about it. It's uh, it's pretty complicated, and uh, you have broken them down into these four uh, four steps, and each of those uh, steps in itself uh, is uh, is complicated in itself. So, uh, you know, if you want to take the distribution part of it as an example, right? Like defining the vendor target list. Uh, sometimes, like you know, it's hard to look for in these technology spaces. Who is the appropriate uh, vendor? Like you cannot just go to the software community, or you just cannot go to the to the industrial uh, industrial equipment community and distribute the distribute this list uh, or this RFP. Maybe maybe the, the the procurement team is missing out on somebody who could meet these requirements, but simply not part of that uh, target list. So it's it's fraught with risks and many many pitfalls and. Uh, that said, the step one is actually the hardest one, the, the project planning. And uh, hopefully with uh, what IIC is doing for uh, for the community here, by making it just a little easy for them to uh, to start with something rather than a blank sheet of paper, right? Like have some method of converting these into a, a RFP skeletal document uh, that leads them to think about questions of how I thought about my sourcing process, how I thought about uh, these requirements that are uh, that are outlined here that could be a, a good start okay pj thanks a lot basam jim um looking forward to seeing you at the next isc meeting and thanks a lot for your support thanks everybody bye thank you thank you, thank you.